Hello everyone, welcome once again to the Adventures Travel Club and here we are back in Cappadocia. We're in the area of, uh, and it's pronounced different ways, but it looks like Gorome. Gorome is right because that's where the accent is on the, in the book. It in the, says Gorome. In the book, yes, that's what it, it says. says. Gorome, okay. yes. Oh, look, Betty, there's a couple of camels over here. Yeah, Want to stop for a ride? <laughs> I was going to say, should we stop and let Mary get on again? <laughs> Oh, I, I tell you, during this trip, we we had the uh, had the opportunity of uh, many times of, of riding camels there. Well, it's a good income, you know, for the camel drivers. They you make they really is. do well. A couple sure of bucks, you know. Yeah. All they need is a couple of tour buses a day, and That's they're right. they're all they, set. They're right? the wealthiest people in Turkey. <laughs> oh boy! Well, somebody's got a penthouse up here. I don't yeah. know. Maybe this was a wealthy person. Or not. But anyway, this is uh, called the uh, the Valley of uh, of Churches, and we're going to listen to our guide, Mamet, explain it to us. The Valley of Churches, Göreme. Well, there are two ways of pronouncing this word. One of which is Göreme, G-O with two dots, R-E-M-E. So if it's M-E, Göreme, that means something hiding or hidden you cannot see. It has this kind of a meaning. But if you pronounce it as Göreme, M I instead of M E G O R E M I Göremi in Turkish of course it says this is something you must see this is something you mustn't skip because when you come from that side of the valley when you enter the valley from over there as you approach to the end of the valley many things are hidden you cannot see you cannot notice if there are churches and these churches are of course uh, containing such or uh, preserving such beautiful frescoes. Only if you go close enough and you go inside, <gasps> oh, so nice, so beautiful they are, then you come face to face with these frescoes. And in that sense, in that meaning, it becomes Göremi, something you must see, that you mustn't skip, as they are well, pre well preserved. And like Zelbe Valley, before lunch, you know, where we went with all these rock cones, fairy chimneys, a lot of people, civilians, people used to live there. But here, this was more the place for the priests and the priestesses. Let's put it that way, serving for the religion, for Christianity. So we have monasteries like that, you know, over here, one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. One was used by the priestesses, the other one by the priests. If you were to go up there, like one floor up, there is uh, one huge room with the table over there that they used to sit around and then have their meals, you know. In the upper parts we have some of these bedrooms. They are not in a very good state of preservation, especially when you're talking about a, a dining room and a dining table. We will have better examples as we go in, so I want to explain to you about them over there. A few of the churches are open, so let's go in and uh, just uh, see what we have over there. Well, Betty, we have a lot to see here because there are several of these churches that are uh, located back in these caves. So I think one of the things that we should explain is that uh, I think Mamet had mentioned priests and priestesses. I believe he meant really priests and nuns in the monastic orders that were there because to the best of my knowledge, uh, Christianity never had any we priestesses. We never had any priestesses. <laughs> They're working on it now, but it's not going for Try it to, right. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, Marv, at one time there were 356 churches there. That one, many? Yeah, one for Whoa. every day in the year, and then one a couple of left over. Well, yeah. we didn't see that many no, on this. No, we didn't. Well, I think there's 30 that are functional now that you can get into. Well, not functional, but you can visit them. Yeah, I don't I don't think any of them are used today as churches. No. But as you say, there's some more restoration work that's being done uh, on, on some of these. We'll see a little bit later on. But now you can see the inside of the first church that we went into. That's sort of a reddish color. It doesn't come out too well. Uh, on television because there isn't any light in there but uh, as you can see it almost looks like if we were to relate it to modern day so it looked like someone took a marking pen but I'm sure that that was little, not the case because marking pens were not invented back graffiti. there. Yeah. You know that the, the colonnades that you see the arch was that's just hewn out of the rock nothing oh, yeah. was the brought whole, in. No put, that's right. So yeah. we, if we could do that in our churches today think how much money we'd save. <laughs> <laughs> The churches are never too long, too big, too uh, high, and uh, unlike St. Sophia in Istanbul, you wouldn't have anything like that. Time-wise, time frame, most of the churches are like between 6th, 7th century up to 12th century. 
Afterwards, of course, some of them will continue to be dug out, but it's very few. I told you more than 1,000 churches and about 360, 65 of them having some uh, colors or press codes or some things like that one. And slightly bigger than this or slightly, uh, almost maybe this size. There are also some smaller churches, this one, but this is sort of a typical size, so to speak. Then it is carved, hewn from the rock. It is basically obvious and it is very easy. There is a hilt up on, uh, on top of this one. So they carve it out, and the pillars that you see over here are part of the carving, so to speak. Sometimes you have one. And Uh, as there are so many of these churches over here, uh, each church is dedicated to either to one major figure or a priest or a priestess or a fresco on one of the walls of these churches. In this case, this is called the Church of St. Barbara. You can see in Greek writing over here, one of the priestesses of uh, Cappadocia, of course, they are sort of important priests or priestesses, so certain churches are dedicated to them. There is another figure over here called Maria or Mary. Uh, this has got nothing to do with our mother, of course, where she married. Just uh, uh, the name and attribution of one of the priestesses in the area. Now, some of the frescoes over here are from the iconoclastic period. Some of those that are left from the iconoclastic period. What do we mean by this one, if you have an idea? In Byzantine period, from about halfway, from 8th century to halfway down to 9th century, uh, less than a century, of course, where there was this iconoclastic period, when, during which time it was all banned to produce frescoes or any other uh, images like that. But, so during this period, of course, uh, as a result of the Byzantine emperors, uh, people stopped making these frescoes, but they used some other symbolic attributions trying to mean, trying to define certain things like that. For instance, being a church over here, normally, if you have a uh, dome like that, you see the cross over that, there should be a figure of Jesus Christ over here, for being an, uh, an attribution of Jesus Christ being dedicated to it. Here, instead of that, you have only the cross. And especially to the right and left of the apse, look at these two reliefs over here. This is one cross, and this is another cross, each of which is slightly different from one another, because one is of the Roman Church, the other one is of the Greek Orthodox Church. So there is this uh, definition over here. Is that the confession? Hmm? Is that the confession? Yes, yes. <laughs> and here, this is another figure. What do you, what do you think this one is? Chicken. Chicken. Rooster. Rooster. <laughs> <laughs> What's this one? Peacock. Uh, Peacock. Okay, Peacock. Then also, behind you, there are two little pools over here. These were originally used for Karda, al Huna, for the purpose of <laughs> baptism. <laughs> Well, we can see that these churches were rather small, but uh, with all the archways and the asps in there, they, I mean, they were, they were quite right. a work yeah. of art. Yeah, and there were so many, too. They had their choice of going to which one they wanted to go to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they celebrate one for every particular day of the uh, year. Oh, I'm sure they had that many priests. Or the snake church, or the serpent church, or even better than the snake is the dragon. You see our St. George, the two saints, St. George and Theodore, trying to kill the, the snake or the, the dragon, actually. And because of the dominant figure of this fresco, this church is uh, called the snake church, as I say to you. Sometimes because there's something outside, like the apple church. Not that you grow apples, there used to be an apple tree over there, most of it. So they just made an attribution to identify this from one another. And here, in this case, it is this major uh, fresco which we see uh, about the apps. As you, if you look at the apps, we have some remains from the iconoclastic period, like this one crosses as you come up. I know it's difficult to see, but it's not in a very good state of preservation. Then, when this period was over, the figure of Jesus with Saint John and uh, Mother Virgin Mary on this side were painted over, but still they are not uh, in a good state of preservation because. There are many reasons, of course, travelers trying to in sort of uh, insert their names, like uh, making a graffiti, then the local people, of course, just imitating them. 
uh, also some of the sort of fundamentalist uh, local people, Muslim people, at a very later stage, especially trying to destroy the facial expression so that the whole image loses the meaning, etc. So throughout the centuries, of course, there were quite a lot of uh, different people visiting these places. And originally, the church was up to this level. You know, you can see now the system of carving is slightly different than the other one. And later on, apparently, they wanted to extend it that way. So they continued the union of the art. But unfortunately, it was not completed, as you can see. Here is the figure of Jesus Christ now, standing with a child of the area. Apparently, he is also getting to know all the details about Christianity. This is how it is all interpreted, basically. This one is interesting. Here is Constantine the Great, the famous emperor of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire of the 4th century, and Helen next to him. And you can see the life-size cross over here. Now, and they are holding onto this cross, yeah. Now, uh, there are different stories about this, but the uh, commonly accepted one is that originally this life-size cross was in Jerusalem. And then later on when Constantinople became the center of Christianity, especially for the Greek Orthodox places we are talking about, they sent this up to Constantinople and uh, it was placed inside Saint Sophia, where it was kept throughout the centuries. Later on, in 1453, what happened? The city fell to the Turks or to the Ottomans. And during that time, this cross was lost. Well, it's too bad that over the centuries that a lot of these frescoes have been defaced, but, you know, I, they're still trying to do restoration work on these, and uh, there's some areas that are closed there where they are doing some restoration work, but still, even that that you can see is still very exciting, uh, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's remarkable as the state of preservation that they're in. It was the humidity in the caves themselves remaining constant that really helped preserve them like they are. Yes, and you know, they, they call this now just a, an open-air museum, as it were. So we know that things now will be, will be protected more than they were in the past. And, and uh, with the restoration work, uh, you know, as it keeps continuing uh, to go on, hopefully they can bring back some of these to what they looked like originally. Oh, yeah. Well, with all the tourists coming to Turkey now, they're going to have a lot of money to be able to spend on the restoration. So in a few years from now, who knows what it's going to look like? It'll be exciting. Well, it is exciting. It is. The whole landscape here, too, of course, every time we take a look at it is so different and so Unbelievable. exciting. Unbelievable. It, right. <laughs> it really is. You, you know, I think if you just showed somebody a picture of this, they'd think that it was you just faked it. it it's, it's not real. <laughs> It well, it does sort of look like a yeah. moonscape or uh -huh. something that you see in a, in a maybe in a space movie, but I, I guarantee it's not. It's right here on Earth, yeah. folks. We got it. We've got it on tape, so you can see for yourself. We'll it, probably do this trip next year again because we've had a lot of phone calls about people thinking, oh, boy, that is a great place. It is. It really is a, is a very, very interesting uh, country to visit. And, of course, this area in Cappadocia, I think, is uh, one, of the, one of the many highlights that, that we saw while we were in Turkey. But uh, just to think... All, what we have seen so far, all of the caves that we saw on, on the earlier programs where the people used to live there. And, but if you just take a look here, now look, there's yeah. stairways here and there and people climbing up on uh, this, that, and the other. And later on, we'll get up even on a, a ladder to go up into one of these areas. But if you want to. <laughs> Only, I mean, really, Marv, there's a lot of people that don't, that would be, uns feel it would be unsafe for them. But, uh, what, so they watch. Well, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good thing to have videotape, right? Yes. Oh, no. Uh -huh. no, because some of these, uh, you know, you don't see any handrails right there. Anyway, we're going to find out a little bit more about uh, some of the rest of this area here. Between that dining room and the church that we are going to be going now, visiting, Sandal Church as we call it, there is the remains of another church. Actually, these were two churches. We call it the Dark Church. The foreground, as you can see, collapsed. And therefore, you only see the remains of the crosses and all that over there. But there's a window, an opening and a glass window there. Can you make it? Yeah. So below that one is a door we're going further into the mountain where there is the second part of the church and it is all dark that's why it's called dark church to start with but uh, it has been closed down for maybe eight years or so now for the restoration of some of these frescoes finally uh, the restoration work is over but then they decided to charge 
the entrance as a separate charge, not, nothing to do with that one. So if some people are interested in going there, each person will have to pay like, you know, one million over there, eleven dollars, just to be able to see that one. Whereas if you buy a guidebook for five, six, seven, eight dollars, whatever, then you get some pictures over there. <laughs> so, well, I don't think I'd pay a million lira to go take a look at a dark church when you can't see anything anyway because it's too dark. <laughs> but, you know, when you talk about a million, you know, people don't understand that that's the way the money is. They're large, large denominations. Yeah. Yeah, well, we became a millionaire very fast yes. just by changing 10 or $11. <laughs> well, now we're going to go inside another church. This one is a little bit higher up, as we can see. So it's up, and here we go. Now, in the earlier churches, we have seen these frescoes when they sort of hewn the church out of the rock. Of course, they made the surface of the wall smooth, mm -hmm. and then they applied the direct painting method from red, etc. They started painting all these frescoes. So, if you look at this one, some of these are earlier paintings. Then, later on, when they these frescoes were no longer good, especially in 12th century, during the peaceful period provided for them by the Turks. I'm not imagining. What's this? Turban. 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 So oh. who has turban? The Turks. 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 What's this? Christian. Yes. What are they? Shaking hands. Shaking hands. Yes. For peaceful living together. And during this century period and followed by Ottoman period. So we see in the frescoes anyway the two uh, uh, major religious groups that are coming together. It was interesting. Well, you know, it's just about time for us to leave this area. And Betty, we did spend a, a lot of time there and uh, we didn't get it all on videotape because so many of those churches and the places we went into were very, very dark and wouldn't turn out on, on the tape. But uh, I could have stayed longer. I mean, it was not long enough for me. There was oh, just yeah, so much so there to there. see. I would have loved to have spent more time. Well, what do you say? Let's go on down the road and let's take a look now at some Turkish rugs. You are in the good hands of Mr. Cemana. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, if you'd like, you can start from this section, this part, because, uh, I mean, this is the uh, seed production process and procedure, but uh, normally, uh, let me state you, I mean, how we do this workmanship. We divide the workmanship of a handmade carpet in three different parts, uh, production of the material, provision of the material, and also workmanship of the material and workmanship of the carpet itself and the handloom. Those are the steps of the workmanship. Uh, but in Turkey there are three different categories of handmade rugs, but good categories, I mean very famous kind of categories. Wool and cotton, wool and wool, and silk and silk. The silk, by the way, uh, we can get from the cocoons here. And this equipment can give you an idea about the traditional and original style of getting the silk uh, threads from the cocoons. But uh, the silk is not produced in this region, by the way, because the silk forms inside the cocoons that you see at the moment, uh, they are created under uh, leaves of the mulberry trees on the northwestern parts of Turkey, and they are uh, cultivated in, in that region. Uh, yes, but we have brought this equipment just to give you an idea to our visitors. But the silk worms, ladies and gentlemen, after a certain period, uh, they turn out to be cocoons like those. But when they are very well matured, uh, we start getting the silk threads, silk yarns from each cocoon. But uh, in order to get uh, because the fineness of a silk thread, silk yarn is very important. I mean, it cannot be thicker than that. If it's thicker than that, the, nuts, the number of nuts per square inch on the handmade silk carpet can be lower. Lower number of nuts, less number of nuts, less precious, more nuts, more precious. This is the relationship. But in order to get this kind of silk yarn, we need a bunch of 15 or 20 cocoons. If it were possible to get only one silk yarn like this, so resistant and also fine, from only one individual cocoon, the silk wouldn't cost so expensive. This is the re uh, reason. So, my friend will show you by picking, ah, by the way, first of all, we have to boil the cocoons. We have to boil. They are boiled at the moment. Then they are boiled, they soften, and they will release the silk substance, white substance, outside, and we pick with this broom. This is the way and the style of how we work. So what happens to the worm? Can you see? Oh. The worm is dead. The worm is dead, yes. Oh. The worm is dead. Oh. So how do you get it out? From this group of the cocoons, bunch of the cocoons, we get only one silk yarn like that, or like that. This is it. Oh, this goes out like that. Oh, be darned. And uh, 
Uh, on this black table, ladies and gentlemen, on this black table, uh, wood you can see and touch also the to the uh, trays of the cocos, individual yarns of the cocos. So no, they are wet. They are wet. They are a little bit sticky, sticky. But when they are dried, they will be very rigid and very stiff. So uh, silk is very, I mean, uh, interesting material. And until we put the whole silk substance outside, outer part of the cocoon, then remain only silk wool. Remains only silk wool inside, dead by the way. And then uh, the whole silk substance will have been put on this spindle. This is the way that we repeat every time, each time. If you like, you can touch it, touch it again. It takes that many to make one thread. Oh, yes, to make one thread, uh, it requires it requires many, it's many, minimum 15 or 20 cocoons altogether. Mm -hmm. Approximately 15 or 20 so cocoons. Ah. It is soft at the yes, moment, so very so delicate so at the so moment, but over there, very delicate. But over here, on this spindle, is very hard and also very rigid, as you see. Well, did you learn a little bit about how uh, the silk threads come out of there? I learned a lot. Boy, I'll really tell you, that's lot. really exciting. I, I had no idea we were going to see all this. But now we're going to go down and see how the dyes are made from uh, natural substances. And uh, I thought this was very interesting as well. So let's take a listen to our guide. So here, ladies and gentlemen, you can see the, the dyeing process of the wool and also the silk. But uh, here there's only wool, woolen material. But the silk will be treated in the same way. But, uh, for example, for the woolen lugs, we get the raw material wool, and it has to be washed. Next step is the washing, because the wool is very dirty. Because our sheep in Cappadocia don't take a shower every day. <laughs> for that reason, we have to wash the wool. Uh, three times, four times, washing is important, because by washing the wool, it can be, it can be refined very well, and then after, it will have to be spun. We have to spin it. And then it will be ready to dye. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, frankly speaking, we cannot claim that all the lugs in the oriental countries, in Turkey also, are made with vegetable colors nowadays. It is impossible, uh, frankly speaking. But in some of the regions where the, tradition, the traditional uh, characteristics are more dominant, more important, the people can still use vegetable and natural dyes. Here you can see some characteristic, uh, also traditional dyes, also uh, interesting dyes. But those are the vegetable colors, by the way, uh, obtained from some of the plants, for example, like those. Some of the plants, by the way, we can translate easily to English. We can translate easily to English. For example, those are the walnut shells. Walnut shells. That is, uh, I mean, quite common. And uh, the way how we get or how we dye the wool, we have to boil uh, in a certain proportion of the wool, certain proportion of, of, uh, of the plant, and also a uh, certain proportion of the water. By boiling uh, different hours, we can get different color tones of the same dye. This is the way. For example, this is the brown color combination from the walnut. Yes, but this is light brown, dark brown. This one, for example, it can have been obtained by morning two hours, that one three or four hours, that one five or six hours. This is the way how we get it. But uh, after, uh, in case of repeating the same thing, to get the same color tone, they can never match 100% equally. Yeah. But this is the originality of the handmade ones. Yeah. Otherwise, they will resemble the machine made colors. But uh, some of the local plants, some of the local grass, local kind of grass, they have got natural uh, names, and, I mean native names, they cannot be translated to English. We get uh, greenish and yellowish color combinations, like those. Uh, the roots of different kinds of trees, the roots of different kinds of trees, but local, regional trees, and the fruits of the trees. For example, this one is the fruit of the elm tree. That maybe you know, elm tree, yes. And the leaves of tobacco can be used. But the most interesting one is this one, which is called indigo. Oh. Indi right, you heard the name of indigo. Uh -huh. Is the but, uh, powder of a plant imported from India, yes. And it has to be immediately boiled with very hot water. When it is in the water, it is yellow. But when it contacts with air, with the oxidation, it turns out to be, first of all, green. Then it will reach up to the original color of blue. Mm. Original, original color of indigo, which is blue. Mm. This is the naturality, particularity of the dye and the plant. So, ladies and gentlemen, after we prepare the material, we have seen the final step is the workmanship are made on the hand loops, depending on the uh, human ability and experience. I mean, this is the most important part of the workmanship on the hand loop. 
But uh, those girls that you see at the moment, uh, certainly, somebody has to show to our visitors. But they prefer also to work nearby to the uh, villages. After having been practiced, uh, I mean, uh, a few pieces of the handmade cuts. For example, after having been masters, masters, uh, I mean, they don't need uh, any supervision of the other teachers, and they will be paid per piece. Because on every following piece, uh, they believe that they can improve better. For example, this one is pure natural silk. You can see all the categories work here in Turkey. This is woolen cotton combination. This is woolen wool, handmade cotton. But uh, uh, for example, uh, in the middle, uh, in the middle you can see the uh, single nuts. I mean, the single nut in the system is used for the Persian cuts. But on top are the double nuts. The Turkish rugs are all made with those double nuts. The advantage, disadvantage, we can discuss, by the way. A Persian rug made with those single nuts can be a little bit finer. But the Turkish rug made with a double nut, it can be more resistant and durable on the floor, especially. Well, I think we're seeing two different types of rugs here. You see, you see the one with uh, silk, and then you see the one that, uh, that, that is wool. So, uh, and I, you know, you can tell the difference, I guess, once you get them out on the floor, because hey, you bought a silk rug I once, have a silk yeah. rug, and you certainly can tell the difference. There's, they're very, very thin. Uh, but, they, but it looks like they change color when you the way that the light plays upon them. They're gorgeous. Oh, they're, they Absolutely are. beautiful. Just think of all this workmanship, Betty, that goes into this. I mean, I this, these girls are working fairly fast, and even that, you it think how long it takes to make Nine months it usually takes for a rug, and I, when I see mine, I, I, I always think of those people working on that and making that rug for me. It's, well, it, it, yeah. it, they really are works of art, and uh, I don't know. The older I get, the more I, the more <laughs> I can appreciate them. I'll tell you, they, uh, it, it's just it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Look how oh, fast she works yeah. there with her fingers. But you know, Marv, each color ha it represents something. Now, the red, which is the commonest, means wealth and happiness, and yellow and black keep away evil spirits. I don't think there's any black in mine. <laughs> and blue is the symbol of nobility, and green indicates paradise. How oh, about great. that? great. I get a blue and green rug. You get a Actually, blue and green one. We're going to see now how the double knot is actually tied. Now she's going to do slowly, double knot, boarding knot. See, she takes it one pile from the back, one pile from the front. She sort of ties them twice from underneath, pulls it down, and breaks it with her finger because this is a woolen thread. Mm -hmm. If it's a silk thread, she cannot cut it or break it with her finger, so she has to. And of course, she was doing this very slowly, just to demonstrate yeah. it for us. But here are some of the rugs. We uh, were entertained with beautiful rugs. The most expensive one I saw was only thirty-five thousand dollars. That's the one you bought. No, 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 no. I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 ha I have some rugs. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I was really not in the market for buying another one. But that was a big one, though, Mark. Oh, very, yeah. Very, very large. Was, that, yeah. It was. Uh, I like this one right uh -huh. here. It was great. Well, anyway, so much for the beautiful Turkish rugs. If you're interested in any of the trips that we have coming up, give Betty a call at 488-7443. You've got a lot of things coming up, right, Lots Betty? Lots of things. So uh, Betty has a newsletter out, and if you'd like to receive that, give her a call, and she'll be happy to get that to you right away. Isn't that right? That's surely true. Okay, it's time for us to say goodbye. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.